Hello and welcome to the first video of the FP2 chapter second order differential equations. On the screen, quick question to get us started. Solving this first order differential equation is quite straightforward. We can separate the variables. To do this, I'm going to put the by on the other side, divide everything by a, and then I will leave the b and the a where they are and move the y and the dx. Now I can integrate both sides. On the left I get log y, on the right minus b over ax plus c, raise that to be a power on e, and then as is convention I'll change the plus c to an a. And there we go. Now if we call that minus b over a m, because that's just a constant, then we have the starting point for what we're going to talk about in this video. Because the general solution, this, gives us a clue as to how we can solve second order differential equations of a similar format to this. So a quick overview of the chapter, we're going to solve second order homogeneous differential equations. Homogeneous there is just a really fancy way of saying when they equal zero. Then we'll solve the second order non-homogeneous differential equations, and you might be able to guess that that is when they do not equal zero. Then we'll look at boundary conditions to find particular solutions, very similar to what we did in the previous chapter. And also similar to the previous chapter, we will use substitution to solve reducible SODE in the last section. So let's go for second order homogeneous differential equations. So from our starter, knowing that this has a solution of this form, we can try to solve this second order differential equation using a very similar solution. What we're going to use is this. And the reasoning behind this is if you think about what this equation is saying, you've got some function plus its derivative, which for most functions can be quite different, plus its second derivative, which for most functions will be different again, and adding these up has to equal zero, with a few constants thrown in. Not many functions can interact with their own derivatives to give you a zero, but you know that e to the x is one of them, because e to the x doesn't really change its form, it just has extra constants coming out the front. It's not the only function, and we'll come back to that later, but this is a really good place to start for that reason. So to see how this works, I'm just going to plug this in. We've got y equals this. I need to find the derivative and the second derivative, put it in and see if we can get something that might equal zero. So let's start with the first derivative. And that will be a alpha e to the alpha x plus b beta e to the beta x. Second derivative, same sort of thing will happen. Now it's a alpha squared e to the alpha x plus b beta squared e to the beta x. Now I can put these into the equation and that will give us a lots of a alpha squared e to the alpha x plus a lots of b beta squared e to the beta x plus b lots of a alpha e to the alpha x plus b lots of b beta e to the beta x plus c lots of a e to the alpha x and c lots of b e to the beta x must equal zero. Now that looks long and fairly horrible, but keep in mind all of the x parts are the same. So these can all interact quite nicely. And in fact, I'm going to factorize out a e to the alpha x and b e to the beta x into two big brackets, giving us a e to the alpha x times a alpha squared plus b alpha plus c plus b e to the beta x times a beta squared plus b beta plus c is equal to zero. Now we can think about how to solve this. 
So making a few assumptions here, we're assuming a and b are non-zero, because otherwise it would collapse back to this, or even just zero. We're also assuming alpha and beta are different, because otherwise these two would simply add together, and again it would collapse to something like this. So to keep it in this format, these are non-zero, and alpha and beta are different. That means in order for this plus this to equal zero, this has to equal zero, and this has to equal zero both at the same time. And this is a quadratic equation. So is this. So we can make this a single quadratic equation where one solution is equal to alpha and the second solution is equal to beta. And that will give us the solution here that makes zero, a solution here that makes zero in a single quadratic equation. And that's quite amazing because we've got a, B, and C here, which were A, B, and C in the original equation. So you won't need to do all of this every time. You can jump straight to here. And alpha will be the solution that you put here, and beta will be a second solution which you can put here. A and B will then be the constants for a particular solution that you'll need boundary conditions to solve for. So to summarize that, by differentiating this twice and substituting it into the second order differential equation, we can see that it will be a solution, but only if this equals zero, where one of the solutions to this is alpha and one of the solutions is beta. This is called the auxiliary equation and is formed from the coefficients of the second order differential equation. I'll do a quick example of this on the next screen, but keep in mind we're not quite finished yet because I did say this was not the only type of function that could do this, interact with its own derivative. You know that sine and cosine differentiate to give cosine and sine respectively. They could potentially interact with themselves. And if you've got x e to the x, when you differentiate that, you get e to the x, which could interact with one of these. But it also gives another x e to the x, so that could interact with itself as you differentiate it. We find that the number of solutions to the auxiliary equation decides which of those specific forms it is. We'll come back to that very soon. A final note on this slide is that the solution to a homogeneous differential equation, where it equals zero, is called the complementary function. Now in this case, that is the solution, that's it. But when we come to non-homogeneous differential equations, we still need the complementary function. So we will still need to do this, but it will only be part of the solution. That's why it's got a fancy name. So a quick example, just to show how easy this is. Here we've got a coefficient of 1, 2, minus 3. So I take those out and I've got 1m squared plus 2m minus 3 equals 0. I solve this to get m equals minus 3, or m equals 1, and then I put that into the form we know, where that first one is alpha, and the second one here is beta. It doesn't matter which way around they go, because if you need to find the particular solution, the constants will just match up as they need to. So on the one hand, it is that easy. On the other hand, there are two other forms you need to be familiar with. Here I've said it can be shown that's a quick way of saying I'm not going to show it, but you can go and find out for yourself if you'd like to, that the nature of the roots of the auxiliary equation determine the form of the solution. So if it has two real roots, alpha and beta, which is what we just did on the previous screen, that happens, you know, when this part of the quadratic equation inside the square root is greater than zero. In that case, as we saw, we have this solution. Alpha and beta are different, we've got two different terms here, everything's fine. However, sometimes you only get one root, it's a repeated root, alpha. And this happens when the expression inside the square root is equal to zero. In this case, if you tried using this format, you would have e to the alpha x and another e to the alpha x, and they would just add together and it wouldn't give you two parts. In this case, the solution is of this form. So you've got a e to the alpha x plus b x e to the alpha x.
Finally, you also know that you might get two complex roots, p plus or minus qi, and you know that they come up in complex conjugate pairs. So for the two roots, p will be the same number, q will be the same number, the only difference will be the plus and the minus. That happens, of course, when the square root expression is less than zero. And in this case, you get your sine and your cosine possibilities. So you get e to the px, where p is the real part, positive or negative, a cos qx plus b sine qx, where q is the absolute value of the imaginary part, here. Now, probably if you were doing research in this area, this would just be something that would be in your head. You wouldn't need to think too much about it. If you needed it for part of your work for some reason, you could look it up in a book. But unfortunately, in terms of an A-level exam, these three things you simply need to memorize. And now I've got eight examples to show how quick they are, how varied they can be, and how important it is to have these three expressions memorized, ready to go. So here we go. We've got m squared plus m minus 12 from the coefficients. That gives m minus 3, m plus 4, which gives us the two real solutions, 3 and minus 4. So we're of the form y equals a e to the alpha, where alpha is 3, x plus b e to the beta, where beta is 4, x. Next one, we've got m squared plus 4m plus 13, and that gives us a complex solution of minus 2 plus or minus 3i. So we have y is equal to e to the px, where p is the real part, so that's minus 2x, times a cosine of q, where q is the imaginary part, 3x plus b sine of 3x. Next one, we've got m squared plus 5m equals 0, which factorizes quite nicely. To give m equals 0, m equals minus 5, two real solutions. So we're back to a e to the alpha x, where alpha is 0, plus b e to the beta x, where beta is minus 5. And obviously, e to the 0 is a 1. So that simplifies to this. Worth noting here that you can have a single exponential function, but that's a specific result, not a general result. Final one on this screen, we've got m squared plus 25. So m is equal to plus or minus 5i. So we're back to this form here. But our real part is 0, so this will give us e to the 0x, which is a 1. So we'll just have the bracket. So we'll have y is equal to e to the 0x times a cosine 5x plus b sine 5x. And like this one, this can happen, but you cannot assume it will happen because it's a specific result of the more general form just like this is a specific result of this more general form. Okay, four more. m squared plus 2m plus 1. That gives m plus 1, m plus 1, which is a repeated root. And that tells us that we need a plus bx, e to the alpha, in this case, minus 1x. Here we've got m squared plus 1. So m is equal to plus or minus i, which is similar to the last one on the previous screen. We've got e to the 0x, that's just a 1, times a cosine x plus b sine x. Here, m squared minus 4m plus 5. This is another complex solution. m is equal to 2 plus or minus i. So we've got e to the 2x a cosine x plus b sine x. Last one, m squared plus 5m plus 6 will give us two real solutions, m plus 2, m plus 3. So the solutions are m minus 2 and m minus 3, giving a complementary function a e to the minus 2x plus b e to the minus 3x. 
And if you wanted to check any one of those, you could, of course, take your solution, differentiate it, differentiate it again, put it back into the original equation with the coefficients, and make sure that it does indeed give you a zero. That should be enough now for you to have a go at the questions in exercise 6a, and maybe I'll see you for non-homogeneous differential equations in the next video.